My name is Ted Gilbert. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. My dad was uh, in the Air Force, so I was kind of raised all over the United States. I uh, born in Chicago, lived in Detroit, lived in San Francisco, lived in Arkansas, lived in Tennessee, lived in Caribou, Maine for the last five years of my dad's stint in the Air Force. Then moved back to Tennessee, and I've been back in Tennessee since I was 17 years old. When I was in the fifth and sixth grade, I went to a one-room schoolhouse in Coble, Tennessee. Coble population was 55. So I went to, uh, I was in the fifth and sixth grade there. There were six of us in the fifth grade. Um, there was only one of us in the third grade, and he was absent one day. And the Tennessean came down and did an article on us called The Day the Third Grade Was Absent because the whole third grade was gone. When I was in the fifth grade, there was three of us that were 11 years old. There was one that was 15, one that was 16, and one that was 21 in the fifth grade. They all had mental disabilities. Um, so those were the, th the five of us, six of us that were in the fifth grade, and we were the biggest class in the one room school house. So. Then we went to, that's when we moved to Maine, Caribou, Maine. I started in seventh grade. Caribou, Maine, went through the 10th grade there, and then moved back to Tennessee when I was a junior in high school, and went to Hickman County High School my junior and senior year, and then came to Nashville to go to college at David Lipscomb, and that's where I went to college at Lipscomb. What was your memory of Nashville? Yeah, my first memories of Nashville was um, <laughs> that um, the first memory I ever had was going to um, but Rudy's Farm. Rudy's Farm. I went to Rudy's Farm. They had some little petting area there, some little things, and then um, that's my first memory of going to something like that. So, and then later on, that became uh, Opryland, where they built Opryland. So, but also, um, where I moved from in Maine, um, it, it was a lot smaller city, and then of course Centerville, where I went to high school, that was a smaller city, even though I'd grown up in larger cities, and just remembering how big Nashville seemed to be at the time. So. I'm the assistant dean in, the, uh, in Brett. Um, I take care of all the finances here. I, um, anything to do, there's a dollar sign in front of it, I handle it. We make sure that 600 students get paid. Um, I have a lot of contracts that I set up with VUMC. Um, as far as uh, uh, postdocs that are on training grants, I have to set up contracts with VUMC to pay those VUMC postdocs. Any kind of expense that those students incur that's a VUMC expense, once a month I have to do an invoice that goes over to VUMC for all those expenditures. They, um, that invoice runs anywhere between $600,000 and $2 million, $2 million a month that I have to invoice VUMC for. So that can take a little effort to get that done. So my first, I started to work in I believe it was December of 1982 was my first job. I came as a temporary. Um, I worked for worked with a man named Columbus Jones in radiology, and my first job was pulling expired X-rays off of the shelves. You know, back then everything was an X-ray before medical rec electronic medical records, and um, so we we would pull off pull all the old X-rays. They could have been just because they're old, no longer a patient here, that kind of thing, and put them in uh, barrels. They had barrels in there, and we put the x-rays in there. And it's my understanding that people bought those x-rays, and because I guess they were made with silver nitrate, back in those days there was silver or something in there, and people would buy them and reclaim the silver out of the x-rays. So that was my first job here. So my first temporary job. So I parked in where the South Garage is now. It was a gravel lot. Um, just had gravel everywhere. It had, you know, where the water had run, little ditches and things and like that. There was no parking lines there. You just parked wherever you could there. Um, and parking was $5 a year. That's how much it cost to park there then. A couple of years later, they added the shuttle buses to get you to come in, to get you a ride in. Um, parking went to $40 a year. So people were complaining that parking went up 800% in one year, from $5 a year to $40 a year. Now you'd be happy with the $40 a year, but that's, that's where I parked now. Well, Light Hall was there. Um, um, 
1982. They just opened the new hospital in 80. So, but all the clinics were still in Medical Center North. So where you see the clinics at, the, the Vanderbilt Clinic now was just emptied all the way down through there. And that's where the helicopter landed, was on the ground right there at the very end of the hospital before they built the clinic on and, and, and all those things. The helicopter landed on the ground right there. I mean, helipad, but it was still on the ground. It wasn't on top of the hospital. So that's where the helicopter landed. So my first boss, I was hired by Gary Bach. You know, Gary just retired here not long ago. Um, he was the administrative officer in OBGYN, and I was hired in, o, in OBGYN by Gary Bach, and Lonnie Burnett was the chairman then, so I worked for Gary and Dr. Burnett back in those days. I, I enjoyed working here. You know, you had a lot of camaraderie. You had a lot of people that you could work with. Um, I can remember that um, the cafeteria was in the basement of the Medical Center North. If you walk in from the courtyard that leans over to uh, uh, the old front of Medical Center North, you know, we've got the little courtyard out there. You walked in there, and if you walk straight, it's a wall now, but that used to be the uh, cafeteria that used to go downstairs in uh, there, and that was the cafeteria. And out, you could, out the side over there is where they had sheep that grazed out in the grassy area out there. So. Um, uh, but I remember going down in the cafeteria there. So. I worked for, after I left OBGYN, I went to work in nephrology in the medical center. I worked for Harry Jacobson then. So, um, and I worked for Harry for about 10, 12 years. And then Harry, you know, went up to be the uh, vice chancellor of the medical center, replacing Dr. Ike Robinson when he, when he retired. Harry took that on, um, I went to work for Ray Harris, who took over after Harry left. And then um, Ray Du Bois took over as the director of the Cancer Center when Hal Moses stepped down. And Ray hired me as the division administrator in the Cancer Center. And we were only there for about two years, and he got offered the job as the provost at MD Anderson. And he'd asked me if I, uh, I would go with him. And, I turned it down two or three times, but then he just kept on. And I went and interviewed, so I went to MD Anderson with Ray, and I stayed there for nine years before I came back here. Story with uh, you know Harry Jacobson, who um, started his own dialysis company because um, to generate money for uh, the for Vanderbilt in his in the nephrology practice here, so. They started their own. Uh, uh, they started their own dialysis company, and then they later sold it to Fresenius, who makes dialysis machines and stuff. They bought it, the company out from him. So he did okay. He did okay. He did okay. I forget how many. It was over. It was a couple of billion dollars that he, they sold the company for. So well, I, I'd always planned on coming back here. Um, my parents still lived here, and my brother still lived here, and my parents were getting older and. They did there as, I was the Associate Vice President of Research Finance there, and how they did there, they did away with grants and contracts, and they moved everything under finance. Um, and um, they, so they were doing, they were changing my job, and um, I just asked for a, uh, if they could give me a, a buyout and let me go home, so. They, they did. They, they gave me a severance package, and I came back here and went back to work at Vanderbilt. And I've been back here about seven years now, I guess it is. Things have changed a lot, of course. Of course, we've added more buildings, um, more technology. You know, technology is the biggest thing that's changed. Um, some of the old uh, ways that we would handle the grant submissions and, and um, those things have changed a lot since I've been back. And they, of course they continue to change too, but technology is the biggest thing I've seen change here. Back in the old, old days, um, when there was a man named Tom Barnes that used to run the pre-award side, um, you took a paper grant up there and he signed the face page of it, PS 398. And then you, he gave you back that paper grant and um, you would make copies and then you would FedEx it to NIH. Um, sometimes uh, you would be running a little late on uh, 
getting it there because they had a cutoff date, so Federal Express couldn't even get there. We had people in the past, assistants, that would make the copies on some of the big grants, put them in Xerox boxes, and then they would get on a plane and had to buy a seat for the grant and put the grant in that seat, and then they would get to Washington and go to NIH and drop it off at a location there at NIH. Um, they stopped taking walk-ins, but for a number of years we would have to do that. If you were still had enough time, you'd put it in your truck and fly to, drive to the airport and drop it off at FedEx there at the airport, and they would take it on. But And now, of course, everything's electronic. You just submit it through. Hit a button. Yeah, hit a button and it goes. Uh, when I was in college at Lipscomb, uh, I worked evenings. I was a, tell everybody I was a product distributor for Mobile Oil Corporation. That means I pumped gas at the mobile station there. So, um, where was that? In Green Hills, right there on the corner of, uh, I, I even forget, right, it was right across from where Crystals was for so long. And um, it was a mobile station there. Tim Swindeman owned it. And I worked there. And um, and he kind of like, the st was kind of like the gas station to the star. So I would, uh, I, George Jones, and, and you know, for years I trained and showed Arabian horses. Um, and I worked for um, a man um, in Green Hill, I mean in uh, Franklin, uh, that was a country music producer, and um, I worked for him and his wife and his daughter. His daughter was hurt in an automobile accident and uh, was in the Williamson County Hospital for a while, an extended stay. And the nighttime nurse, her, and that was Brent, Brent was a music producer, um, the nighttime nurse kept telling Diana, which was Brent's daughter, you know, I sing, I sing, I sing. And she was there from 11 to 7, 11 to night, 7 in the morning. So um, she never got to see Brent. She wanted to pitch something to Brent. So Diana got to be friends with him, which was Brent's daughter. And she said, well, bring me, it's how long ago, bring me a tape and I'll give it to my dad and we'll, um, we'll uh, see what he thinks. So she did and uh, that turned out to be Naomi Judd. So Naomi was the nurse there, so Brent discovered the judge and, and produced him. Of course, Brent produced a lot of stars over the years. So and his wife was an artist, did paintings and sculptures and bronzes and all that kind of stuff. So, And then Diana, she ran the music company for her dad, and she also wrote, wrote a line of children's books. And their son was one of the uh, uh, lead guitarists in all the uh, studio tapings and stuff. He did that. Now, I always told Brent it should be against the law that one family has so much talent. You know, they had talent and everything. So, um, so anyway, that was, uh, uh, that was it. And so I had a number of clients in the horse business um, that were in the country music business. Uh, um, Lee Greenwood and some of the others. But my favorite client of all times was a guy named Sonny West. Sonny was Elvis's bodyguard for 15 years or so. So he always had the greatest stories. You know, he would come in and We'd sit after we worked horses, and uh, he would uh, always relate stories about Elvis. So it, it was great sitting and listening to him talk about that stuff. Oh, uh, George Jones and Tammy Wynette came in, and it was Christmas time. They'd been out Christmas shopping, and they were in a limo, but George was driving the limo, and um, 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 Tammy was riding in it. So they came out, and um, they had a car at the house they needed to bring back to the service station to get worked on. So it needed somebody to ride to the house to pick up the Corvette. So um, George was driving, Tammy was in the front seat, and I was in the back in the limo park. Of course, I had my mobile uniform on. I had Ted on there. So, you know, <laughs> people were trying to look in there to see who the guy in the back was. I guess they thought it was uh, Ted that owns mobile that was riding around in this big stretch limousine. So so that was uh, that was a good time. Yeah, well, it's definitely changed for the better. I mean, I mean, there's good people here. You know, the big change was in the separation when, when Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Vanderbilt University split. Uh, it's made things a little more difficult. I, I deal a lot with the VUMC, um, with the students over there. You know, we have like 600 students here in the, in Brett, and um, about half of them, 50% of them are, over, are in VMC labs. So I have to interact with VMC quite a bit. And, and, and the split has made things tougher on the interaction as far as getting things. Everything's a contractual obligation now where it used to be they were just part of us. So it's, it's really become tougher as far as with that interaction. Well, 
it's just become more difficult. Everything's a contract nowadays, so that's that's made it tougher. But um, but the but the place has grown. And there's still great people here, so I've enjoyed my time at Vanderbilt on the VMC side and the university side too. My wife's an interior decorator, so she works. Her office is in the house, so she doesn't want me hanging around there. So I'm I'm going to have to uh, look to uh, see what. I, see what I want to do. I, I've had some friends that still are, are pretty big in the horse business, so they would like for me to help with uh, the horses to a degree. Not as much manual labor anymore, but more uh, consulting on buying and selling horses. You know, we uh, um, I worked with the Arabian horses, so th there was a, a, a big market for that. They're usually pretty expensive horses, so, um, so I've had people ask me about that. Plus, I was thinking about doing some volunteer work also. Maybe here at Vanderbilt, or you know, you know I, I live in Murfreesboro, and Vanderbilt's got some clinics and hospitals out there too. So they have a small children's hospital out there too. So and a c cardiac is out there too. I trained and showed them for different people. I, again, like I said, for mayors, for I we had a horse for Shania Twain. So um, I would train them and show them, and we showed all over, mostly in the southeast. Um, what does that mean? Show? You take them in an arena and show them, and then they win prizes, uh, and they uh, become more um, more valuable. You know, back in the old days, um, um, you can buy a horse. Straight line depreciation was seven years. You could depreciate him over seven years, and then you sold him, and he was taxed as a capital gain, which was a lot lower tax bracket than. Uh, income for the, some of these folks. So um, you would do that and then you breed them and then have babies and sell the babies. I worked um, for, um, I had horses for the Frist family, the HCA folks. Um, Bobby Frist was the one I worked with mostly and he, you know he had horses that started at 90,000 and went to 1.5 million so um, and he had probably 20 of those type of horses. So. Um, so, because it's a foal, but yeah, we always just said babies. I mean, it can be a, a colt or a filly, a male or a female. So, yeah, yeah. I uh, when I was in college, I also worked for um, for um, dang, what's it called now? Burton, you know, Burton Hills Farm down there. Mr. A. M. Burton and his wife owned that, and it was a big horse thing. There, you know, they had a barn with a cobblestone driveway, and go in the Hall of the barn had this rigging that would come down and lift up all this, the harnesses and stuff off the horses. But um, I, I worked there when I was in, in college um, also. So Where's that located? It's Burton Hills now. You know, if you drive through Green Hills and you're going up before you hit. And Harding? Yeah, before you get up to Harding there, the, all that big, that was a farm then. So it was a big mansion there then. So um, I worked there when I was in college. Um, Mr. A.M. had passed away, but Mrs. Burton was still there. and. I, I worked there taking care of horses they had there, and then bush hogging the fields and stuff like that. When I was in, uh, when I was in college, I was doing that, working there for him. And then he he willed it to David Lipscomb when he when Mrs. Burton passed, and um, David Lipscomb. It was like there was like 200 acres there, and Lipscomb owned it, and then of course they sold it off and developed it. So um, yeah. just that I, I've been very lucky to work with so many great people here over the years. I made a lot of friends here. I've uh, Met a lot of interesting people. I've had a lot of great times here, and um, you know. And then the people that are still here that that have been around as long as I can remember, uh, been around as long as I am. You know, we're getting fewer and fewer as uh, time passes. More and people um, retiring. So I'm looking forward to retirement. So I just, uh, like I said, after four years, I'm uh, I'm ready to call it quit. So. Um. I just wanted to say I have really enjoyed my 30 plus years here at Vanderbilt. I have met many great individuals over those years. I wish everyone continued success in their professional and personal lives.